And today we are reading the sixth day hero. This chapter 16 is called Gideon. <clears throat> the next day, the fourth day of the war, Benny and I returned to school. I'm glad to be back. Your education comes first, my parents always say. The Jews have a long history of being kicked out of the countries they lived in, so we have always revered learning as the one form of wealth that can never be stolen. Because while tools, money, and land can be taken away, knowledge cannot. So it doesn't surprise me that school reopens the moment it's being safe. No one, especially not our enemies, will keep us from learning. It feels good to be busy and to pretend that everything is normal. That afternoon, my dad gets a few hours of leave. He, he is stationed a few kilometers away from the front with the quartermaster unit. He hasn't seen any fighting. Now that all the fighting has been pushed out of Israel and into the other countries, we feel much safer. More rumors trickle in about the terrible battle at Ammunition Hill. It might end up being one of the worst battles in this war, with hundreds of dead on both the Jordanian and Israeli side. I can't shake my fear about Gideon, but when we see my dad, he reassures us. He saw Gideon come through his base on the first day of the war. They managed to snatch a brief conversation. He doesn't think Gideon's unit had been assigned to go to the hill. I'm sure he's fine, my dad tells my mom. He's sunburned and tired with purple shadows under his eyes. You should have seen it, he says, his lips cooking in a smile. He looks great. The whole unit was cracking jokes. They're fine. My mom has had a furrow between her eyebrows for days now. It eases for a moment at my father's calm confidence. I just wish we could hear from Gideon, my mom says, not swept away by the wave of growing euphoria sweeping up pity. I heard that the Kellermans already had a letter from their son. You worry too much, my dad says, patting her back comfortingly. He's too busy to write us right now. That's normal. Our boys have pushed the fight so far into Jordan and Egypt that the generals are arguing about how far to go. My dad's eyes sparkle with elation. I'm telling you, this war might end up being the best thing that ever happened to our country. The old city is ours. He shakes his head in wonder. 200 years from now, the Jewish people will celebrate this as a great miracle, a greater miracle than Hanukkah and Purim combined. It's almost unreal to hear that coming from my dad after the month of fear and stress that led up to the war. But he's right that the news reports coming in are all amazingly, almost miraculously, in our favor. Once again, that's God. Our military pushed the Egyptians literally into the Suez Canal. In Jordan, our forces drove the Jordanians out of the old city and the West Bank. Jerusalem is ours, my dad repeats, his face flushed red with sunburn and excitement. After 2,000 years, did you ever think you'd live to see this day? He turns to smile at me. After the fighting is over, I'll take you there. I'll show you my old house, my neighborhood street. There's no place on earth like the alleyways of the old city. I can see it. The five of us wandering through the street. My dad pointing out his childhood hangout. My dad returns to the base after a quick meal with us. He promises to try and see us again soon. The next day is Saturday. The house is quiet. Ofra is mobile enough to take care of her children now. Our apartment has been blessedly free of Geffen since yesterday afternoon. I tried to read All Quiet on the Western Front. It's told from the point of view of a 19-year-old soldier who thinks that war will be a great adventure, but instead everything is terrible. One by one, his friends are killed. Plus, there's nothing to eat. After a while, I put the book down. I never did manage to get it to Gideon. Maybe I did him a favor. We stay close to the radio, listening to updates about the fifth day of the war. The war is clearly winding down. There's talk in the international community about a ceasefire. The Arab countries are starting to sound interested in declaring an end to the fighting. But until my dad and Gideon are home safe, we can't rest. My mom is filled with a nervous energy. Since the Geffen children returned home, she's been scrubbing floors, vacuuming rugs, dusting, and baking elaborate desserts from morning to night. It's as if she was trying to dirty as many dishes as possible so she'd have more to clean. I think she was glad to have all those extra kids to keep her busy. But now that it's Shabbat, she can't do chores to keep herself busy. She just paces restlessly and keeps ducking out of the apartment to talk to our neighbors. By the time I give up on my book, my mom is setting out a platter of cinnamon sugar, rugula, 
that she baked yesterday. I reach for a cookie. Only one, my mom says, the rubber are for the guessing. Osha's stitches are inflamed and she has to go back to the clinic. The kids are coming down here in a few minutes. She almost sounds happy at the thought of chaos centering our apartment again. Will they spend the night, I ask. I wouldn't mind having Scott here as company. I don't know yet, she says, setting the platter down in the center of the coffee table. It depends on what the nurse says. If the leg is very bad, they might keep her overnight. Otherwise, they'll just give her penicillin. That's an antibiotic. When I hear steps in the hallway outside our door, I assume that the Geffen children are clomping down from upstairs. I slip a cookie in my pocket. Cookies don't tend to last long around Geff. A moment later, we hear a firm series of knocks. That's not how kids knock. I suddenly feel a wave of goosebumps shiver down my back. The hair on the back of my neck rises. Ema, I say in a strangled voice, don't answer that. At the same time, Benny comes out of his room rubbing his eyes, still wearing my old green truck pajamas. After lunch, my mom insisted he take a nap, though he complained to high heaven that he didn't need one. I fell asleep, Benny grumbles accusingly. What's going on? Don't open it, I say at the same time that my mom pulls open the door. Two men in Class A olive green uniforms stand in the hall. My skin prickles hot and cold. There is only one reason the Army sends two soldiers in Class A's to a family's home, and my mom just stands there frozen. I stare at the young soldiers, my heart thumping in my chest, as if I'm teetering on the edge of a cliff. A dark pit yawns below me. Oh, no, my mom raises a shaking hand to her lips. No, please. I'm very sorry, says one soldier, and he looks miserable. He holds some papers in his hand. May I come inside? No, my mom shakes her head. No. What is it? Benny cries, looking in confusion from the soldiers to my mom and me. What's wrong? I'm so sorry, says the first guy. I'm here to tell you that Private Gideon, Lior, has fallen. No, my mom shrieks, covering her ears. Her screams ripped, her scream ripped into me. It's <clears throat> told you this was going to be hard. It's the sound of pure horror and grief. I don't want you here. Go away. She starts to close the door, and the soldier puts his hand out to stop her. Benny, crying without even fully understanding, runs to my mom. Go away, he yells at the soldier, standing in front of my mom as if he could protect her. Leave my mom alone. She covers her ears, shaking her head. No as if she can stop the news from reaching her, as if she can stop it from happening. Benny tries to wrap his arms around her, but she's so far gone, she doesn't even realize he's there. Even as part of me knows it isn't their fault, I hate the soldiers. We were fine. We were okay until they showed up with their terrible, earth-cracking news. Across the hallway, Mrs. Friedberg opens her door. She takes in the scene, understanding the situation in an instant. She looks at me, her face suddenly haggard and old. She hurries past the soldiers, rushing upstairs. I'll take those papers, I say numbly, walking to the doorway and reaching for them. The soldiers exchange looks. The first soldier hands them to me. Can we come in? The soldier repeats uncomfortably. We usually sit and stay with the family until friends arrive. It's not good to be alone with news like this. No, my mom says woodenly. Her arms are wrapped around Benny in an automatic gesture of comfort. Go away. We can't stay if you don't want us, the soldier says, looking exhausted. It's your choice, but we're here for you. Emma, it's okay, I hear Benny tell my mom. They're leaving. It's okay, Emma. My mom's legs give out from under her, and she sinks down to the ground, taking Benny with her. She's still shaking her head as if by disagreeing with the news, she can change it. Then we hear Mrs. Friedberg and Ofer making their way slowly down the stairs. Ofer leans on Mrs. Friedberg's shoulder, her leg bandaged and tender, but infected leg or not, she's here ready to help. We've got it, Mrs. Friedberg says to the young soldier, her German accent thicker than usual. You boys go. We'll handle this. Okay, the soldier nods in relief. Thank you. 
do do you know what happened to him? I asked, breaking through the numbness. He he died, one of them says awkwardly. No, I shake my head. I mean, where? How did it happen? We don't know too much yet, the other one says. He's short with wiry curly hair. His unit is the one that was caught in the alley of death. The alley of death. I close my eyes and all I see is Gideon. <clears throat> the curly haired soldier crouches down so that we're eye to eye. This war has cost us a lot, he says in a low voice. There isn't a family in Jerusalem that hasn't suffered. He isn't much older than Gideon. There's a sadness in his face that seems ancient. It's only because your brother was strong and brave that we are safe. That's a terrible price for your family to pay. But truly, your brother died so that our country could go on. I stare at his polished black combat boots. There's a small scuff on the right boot. It makes him suddenly human. I can't hate someone with scuffed up boots. When we stand before God and give an account of our lives, he continues in a low voice, we have to say what we did, who we helped, how we shaped the world and made it better. Your brother will be able to say, I saved my country. I unified Jerusalem. I protected my family. I look at him stone-faced. He meets my eyes. He swallows heavily. There aren't many people who can say that. I don't care about accounting before God. As far as I'm concerned, God has a lot of accounting to do before me. How many families have you visited today? I ask. And the soldier shakes his head. Too many. He sighs. You're not suffering alone. He squeezes my shoulders as if to press in strength, and then he rises to his full height. As we speak, Mrs. Friedberg and Ofra lift my mom off the floor and guide her onto the couch. They sit Benny down and make him a cup of chocolate milk. They pour my mom a shot of brandy and force her to drink it. Their low, soothing murmurs calm the air. The platter of cookies sits on the low coffee table as if we've been expecting guests, as if my mom made food for the mourners instead of the other way around. I'm deeply sorry, the first soldier says. You should go, I say. The soldier nods, accepting my order. He extends his hand, and automatically I take it. Gideon is a great guy and a brave soldier. He shakes my hand firmly. Then both men salute me. The country will never forget his service and the sacrifice he made so that we may live. I stare at the soldiers. They're saluting me like I've done something good, but I haven't done anything. None of this feels real to me. I wonder if I will wake up in my bed. Maybe none of this is real. They leave, disappearing down the stairs. I remain rooted to my spot by the door. I watch the scene inside my apartment as if I'm looking at someone else's family, someone else's story, someone else's loss. Mrs. Friedberg has placed a mug of something warm in my mom's limp hand. Ofra has pulled Benny into her lap, rocking and murmuring to her. Gideon? Gone? I shake my head as if to banish the thought. Gideon? who is strong and agile and can race across the top of a chain-link fence, has fallen? The thought sends a shard of pain so deep into my heart that I gasp. I'm losing my balance. I'm going to fall into that black pit. What are the three musketeers without their best, strongest partner? I suddenly can't bear it. I can't stand to be in the apartment. I slip away through the open door, feeling like I'm going to be sick. Gideon? Gone? The world has stopped making sense. I'm falling. Okay, I'm not sure we have to stop here. So I don't know if you picked up on the foreshadowing. Um, that the pit in his stomach, in Mahdi's stomach, for the past days as he's just had that uneasy feeling. That was foreshadowing about what was going to happen. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll read some more this afternoon.